The life of Siddhartha Gautama, who lived from about 563 to 483 BC, who came to be known as Buddha or the Enlightened One, is known only through the traditions of his followers. These traditions were handed down orally until several centuries after his death when they were committed to writing. By this time, they'd become more legend than fact. The Buddha was born into what is now southern Nepal, into a wealthy ruling Hindu family. And according to tradition, at his birth, it was predicted that he would become a great universal emperor or teacher and that four signs would be shown him the course he should follow. His youth was spent in luxury, protected from much of the world's misery by his father. At age 29, to his father's dismay, he was exposed to the four signs that were to set the course of his future. For the first time in his life, he saw old age, a decrepit old man, sickness, a man ravaged by disease, and death in a corpse, and true serenity, a wandering religious mendicant. In reality, it is told, the men that Siddhartha saw were actually gods who had taken disguises in order that Siddhartha might become the Buddha. The first three signs were recognized as the presence of suffering in the world. Because of the accepted Hindu idea of reincarnation, suffering was not finite, but for eternity. In the fourth sign, the peaceful euphoria of the religious wanderer became Siddhartha's goal, to solve the riddle of suffering, how it came into being, and how to dispel it. He then went through a soul-searching period during which he did away with his wealth and took upon himself the life and style of a monk. The noble quest, as the Buddhist tradition calls this time, helped him develop techniques of meditation and self-discipline. When Siddhartha was 35 years old, while he was still struggling with the problem of suffering, he was surrounded by various gods and along came Mara, the Buddhist devil. While he went through this time of temptation, he achieved Nirvana, the ultimate detachment from the world that brings an end to suffering. Thus, he became fully enlightened, the Buddha. India's religious history is a fascinating one. Buddha led the first major spiritual reformation in the country. And like Jainism and much later in the 15th century, the Sikh religion with their colorful turbans, Buddhism became somewhat of a mystical protest against the Hindu Vedic ritualistic formalism and its caste system in which one's destiny is dictated by the caste into which a person is born. In Hinduism, if you're born into a Brahmin family with its tilak mark of the upper caste on your forehead, you are destined to a life of considerable luxury compared to a person born into a family of a lower caste who might be a farmer or one who cleans toilets for a living. In Hinduism, once a toilet cleaner, always a toilet cleaner. The caste system has been an effective way for the upper crust to control the masses in the name of religion. The Buddhist solution was and has been a rather mystical one. The Sikh approach to confronting the caste system, on the other hand, was a bit more practical. Yet it got them in trouble on two fronts, with the Muslims by promoting women as equals to men and with 
Hindus for not submitting to the authority of the Hindu priests. While Europe was going through the Reformation with the likes of Calvin and Luther, India was struggling with its second Reformation, spearheaded by the Sikhs. Through exposure to Christian ethics and Western values, things have changed a bit in India since the days of Buddha's childhood. However, problems still remain. Many of Buddha's observations were a step in the right direction. Buddha said, not by birth does one become an outcast, and not by birth does one become a Brahmin, that is, a priest. In Buddhism, one deals with problems within through right thinking, conduct, and spiritual discipline, rather than through rites of sacrifice to nature deities and such. One's goal is to attain nirvana, by which through right thoughts and deeds one may break the fatalistic Hindu idea of reincarnation and enter a state of calm insight, passionlessness, and wisdom, and no longer subject to rebirth into the sorrows of existence. It has been said that Buddhism, like Hinduism, is a family of religions rather than a single religion with an equally long list of teachings or sutras. As time passed and Buddhism was pressured out of India by traditional Hindu priests, and as it made its way into China and Japan, it went through many changes. At times, it conflicted with the local religious beliefs, but often it was homogenized with some of the ideas of the native religions. During the Sung Dynasty from 960 to 1279 in China, the Taoists and Confucian rivals found themselves borrowing from each other. In the late 6th century in Japan, the Shinto, or Way of the Gods, religion became tolerant and even eventually fused with Buddhism. In Japan, the Kami, or Divine, where we get the word Kamikaze, or Divine Wind, might have been anything that is powerful or mystical, a mountain such as Mount Fuji, or an animal, or an ancestor, or the emperor, or the rising sun. The sun goddess Amaterasu was Japan's divine symbol. Buddha fit nicely with all these ideas of the divine. In 724 through 749, a temple was built to house a colossal bronze Buddha. It is recognized as the largest of its kind in the world, and it expresses the spiritual values of the country. As a result of all this mixing of traditions and various forms of idolatry, there are many different schools of thought and practice in Buddhism today. Thank you.